All right, so uh, welcome back uh, to Principles of Modeling for CPS. Today we are uh, officially going to start our first module. So previously, you know, I gave you an overview of the three different um, sort of exemplar of cyber physical systems that we will have a very deep dive into uh, during the semester. And so the first one was based on physics and principles of physics and how you can leverage you know, fundamental physics to model, mathematically model a system. And that's what we will get started with. And in particular, the sort of model, physics-based model that we will spend a lot of time on are called state space models, right? So, so that's what uh, this lecture and maybe even the next lecture is going to be about. Uh, and once we are familiar with what do we mean by physics-based uh, state space models, it's only then that we will start looking at the domain of energy CPS and uh, the particular problem of modeling uh, dynamics of a room or a building using this physics-based uh, sort of toolkit that we will learn about today. Right, so uh, first things first, I have already sent an email about this on Piazza. Is anybody here who is not on Piazza and hasn't received these notifications? Come talk to me after the class, right? So I, I won't repeat that in every lecture. So, um, so the first thing is that you know, in this course we will rely quite a lot on several uh, toolboxes and tools made available by MathWorks, in particular MATLAB and Simulink and Stateflow are are the ones we'll use a lot. Uh, and so the uh, the software that we will use is, is freely available to anyone who has a UVA computing ID, that also includes the online students, you know, who are not physically here. If you have a computing ID, you can visit this URL or you can go to the sort of the web page uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the course and there's instructions on how you can download. Earlier today, I sent an email of when you download MATLAB, if you haven't done it in a while, it, it will prompt you, you know, what tool, what additional sort of capabilities do you want to install? And there's a very, very long list of stuff you can do with MATLAB. So I sent some recommendations on what I consider is the canonical set that will be enough for this course. I mean, feel free if you have you know, more space on your, on your hard drive to go ahead and knock yourself out with whatever you want to install, but at least install those bare minimum toolboxes because that will allow you to uh, work on the, uh, the assignments. Okay, and talking about assignments, uh, this is the second lecture, but the first assignment is uh, already out as of like five minutes ago. So uh, typically I release assignments before the lecture and then based on whether you have 10 days or a week or in some cases even two weeks, the assignment is always, always due before the lecture as well, right? So this assignment, uh, and I have a hard copy that you can grab after the lecture is over. Um, this is a very straightforward assignment to refresh your skills and memory of differential equations and get you into the zone of being familiar with MATLAB and creating a MATLAB function or a script to, to do something with differential equations, right? So, so don't get scared if you haven't, you know, done that in a while. That's what this is meant for. But this is also part of your, you know, assignment grading curve. So don't neglect it as well. So this is due in one week, uh, this uh, assignment on state space modeling. Uh, since this, this assignment has both programming parts and some non-programming parts, uh, I'm very flexible in terms of how you want to turn in your non-programming parts. Some students like to use uh, LaTeX or some you know, editor to turn everything in a soft copy, like two thumbs up if you can do that. But if you are old school and you prefer turning in a pen and paper uh, response to the non-programming uh, part of the assignment, then by all means you can do that, but you have to turn in your physical assignment before the lecture or at 2 p.m. Uh, before or on Thursday next week. Okay, so, and for the programming part, the, uh, uh, I said this last time as well, the only use of uh, UVA collab that we will make, um, I want to keep everything in the same ecosystem, right? So we have the website on which I post everything. There's Piazza to discuss everything, but there's collab for you to respond to those assignments, okay? So upload, the file according to these instructions are pretty clear on what you can upload. Uh, don't upload each file separately, just zip them together is all what we are asking. And it makes life easy for your TA and you know, reduces the chances of them omitting some of your stuff that you have uploaded or um, evaluating it incorrectly. All right, so assignment one is out. So today, as promised at the end of the previous lecture, we are going to talk about how do you predict the future, right? So, and then why do you care about predicting the future? 
uh, and so in general, you know, this this is a pretty hard hard thing to do. Like even uh, top quality physicists agree this is the most difficult thing to do, right? Then it would have been a very uh, uh, different world that we would live in if you could reliably predict everything. But that's the challenge in, in any kind of modeling, right? You can think of a model as a desire or an attempt to predict the future of some system, right? So, and that's sort of what I want to focus on today. So rather than saying we want to just predict some arbitrary future of a system, we want to define it and define this very formally. What do we mean by this, right? So as, as indicated here, we want to predict the future states and outputs of the system using physics-based mathematical modeling, right? So I'm very precise on the objective of this module here, right? So because we saw there's different kind of modeling, so we looked at mathematical modeling as an example, uh, and physics-based implies, you know, we'll use some, some very uh, uh, fundamental knowledge of physics in terms of the domain that we will explore. Uh, but things which are not clear so much right now are what do we mean by future states and what are outputs. Okay, so that's sort of what we will define today and, and get you to the point where you will know what is meant by state space, right? So, so that's really the sort of the core of the enchilada here. Okay, so before we proceed further, were there any questions on, you know, the CPS part? It was very introductory, but uh, I'm curious if there were any concerns or questions on the, the progression of the course or, you know, stuff that we discussed about CPS, closed loop, anything in particular that you want to ask? Okay, everybody is good. Okay, so if everybody is good, then I have a question of my own. Um, so, you know, we spent a, a sort of an hour last time uh, on Tuesday talking about what are cyber physical systems and attempting to describe them in some intuitive manner. Uh, definitely saw a lot of examples of what we can consider as a closed loop CPS system with or without human in the loop. My question is, at no point anybody was curious to ask, or maybe it didn't cross your mind, so that's why I want to ask it myself. What is a system? Right? We've seen examples of cyber physical system, but what do you consider is the definition of a system? So what are some thoughts on this? It's a bit pretty straightforward, almost like an English question rather than a, yeah. Okay, so uh, I'll repeat, I'll usually repeat stuff for this microphone so that the online students can hear. So the response was it can be a process to transform inputs to outputs. That's a good way of thinking. Anything else? Any other thoughts of what's a system? Like we, this word is so ubiquitously used in the English language that we don't even think about whether this stuff is a system or not. It's like, it's almost like subconsciously we are agreeing to, yeah, yeah, this is a system. So that means we understand what it is. So why don't you try to describe what you think is a system? Yeah? A group of things which work together towards a common goal. Okay, a little bit, again, I can, you know, keep going down this rabbit hole of what's a common goal, what's a group, and all that stuff. But I, I see what you mean. Maybe, maybe some more suggestions. Let me give you some examples of systems and, and then repose this question, right? So, so they are tangible systems and stuff that we will look into in buildings and the, the cardio pulmonary system. But then you know, hear about these non-tangible systems, like governance system is not a physical system or economic systems. Some of you may care about grading systems in this course, so, so we, did, we use that. So do these definitions apply to, to those? Is it a transformation from inputs to outputs? Were things working together towards a common goal? Do you agree, disagree? Any other thoughts on what can be described as a system? I'm not asking for examples. I'm asking for within a transportation system, what is the system? Right? How do you define this is a system and this is not a system? I'll let that marinate for another 20 seconds. Does anyone think any of these examples are not a system? What's your definition of system? Well, Okay. Um, I don't know, uh, that seems to be a common property and theme. 
Right. Sure. Okay. So, but you brought up a very good point that you know. Let me sort of summarize sort of what what people have said so far. There's there's this notion of inputs and outputs. We haven't really defined what that is, but I think people have some idea of what that could be. There's a notion of some objective or a goal, and then finally there's this uh, notion of um, you know some components working together, and and in fact all of those are along the correct lines of how we would take a view of the systems, right? So I, I don't ever get into semantics and definitions myself, much like yourself. So, um, so one way to, to understand what a system is based on sort of one of the responses, uh, you can think of any system having some components, let's call them components. These components could be systems of their own, in fact, but uh, any system will have one or more component. And I'm not saying this is a physical entity that you can touch and feel, it's just something which is defined to be uh, the, the, pro, the sort of the uh, uh, you know, thing of interest that you are interested in modeling or monitoring. So it's a, it's a collection of components and uh, it would be pretty uh, sort of trivial and non-interesting if these are just working in isolation. So usually when you have a collection of components, they have to interact, right? So uh, they interact in some ways, very trivial ways or some non-trivial, and I'll de define what non-trivial is in, in just a bit. But you have this collection of components, there's some interactions, and we can call this a system, right? It's a very sort of loose definition at this point. The thing to note is that when you define something as being a system, you're automatically also defining things which are outside of the system, right? So by calling a collection of components a system, we are automatically also telling um, the, the user or, or in general ourselves, here is what is not part of the system and here is what is part of the system. So, so there's this notion of a boundary, if you think, right? So there's a system, it has a boundary, and this boundary is not physical again, it's just some abstraction. Uh, and the, what is ever, whatever is outside of the system, we can typically can refer to that as the environment in which the system operates, right? Not the physical sort of environment um, as in what we understand day to day, but in general, right? So you have a collection of components and environment. So, so then how does the environment and the system interact with each other is sort of the next logical question. And here is where the notion of inputs and outputs fits in very perfectly, right? So inputs is nothing but a way for the environment to assert its effect on any system. And then these collection of components do whatever they are doing, if it's an economic system, healthcare, or in fact a tropical storm. And the storm then influences the environment through outputs, right? So the system can influence the environment or assert its influence on the environment through outputs. So this is what input and output mean, and this is what a system means. So this is again not a precise mathematical definition. I don't think a, a, a precise mathematical definition exists. There are many variants of this, but this is a good mental map. And these inputs and outputs, they can be, uh, more often than not very time varying they change over time because that's what that's how the real world works right what we are trying to model so these are sort of attributes of what you can think apply to most systems there may be some other you know uh, definitions out there but in general based on this picture i can now attempt to say that a system is nothing but a relationship between inputs and outputs so actually i don't care how many components are there how they interact i define a system as a mathematical relationship between input and outputs. And it applies to both physical components and abstract things. Yeah? So I'll define it precisely later, but uh, one example of non-trivial interaction is uh, a non-linear interaction or an interaction which changes over time rather than just a static relationship, okay? You will see an example of that. Okay, so this is still in this zone of let's try to at least think about, we use this term so much that people have stopped thinking about whether this is a system or not, right? So when you define something as a system, I want you to think of, are you really defining a relationship between some inputs and outputs? And if you can identify those inputs and outputs, then you are you know, within the realm of using some of this modeling and systems theory work that we will talk about later. The other thing, which is just a note worth mentioning, this is not always true. In fact, uh, I encourage you to find examples where the next statement is not going to be true. This view of how systems operate is called a causal definition. What do we mean by that? It means we are implying that the outputs depend upon 
the present inputs or the past inputs, right? So there's a cause and effect. There's a directionality associated with how this interaction takes place. And intuitively, you can, it's pretty hard and challenging to think about a system where the output will depend upon future inputs. I don't think we can easily nail that one down. Well, if you have suggestions on what that could look like, uh, you're welcome to sort of uh, explore this on Piazza. But this framework or the way of thinking about what a system is is causal. The inputs go into a system. There's some you know, uh, uh, computation or some transformations of the inputs, as was suggested, takes place. And then the output is the one that the system produces to interact with the environment. And there's this cause and effect relationship. Okay, is this clear? Yeah? Yeah, the output can be as many steps after the input. Uh, this doesn't seem to, I think you are getting sort of uh, reading too much into the notation of y of t and u of t. Uh, it could be different time steps. I just mean to say they are time varying. So they are functions of time. I don't mean to say they are happening at the same time necessarily. Okay, so let's keep going. So, so I won't go into many more examples again. We've already sort of done that in the previous lecture. But what I want to say is, so many real world systems, whether they are physical, such as you know, engineering, many engineering things are physical. Most of mechanics, biology is physical. But there could be abstract, such as economics and social science. Abstract as in we cannot touch uh, something tangible in social science, besides maybe money. Um, so these are all examples of systems. And it turns out. This is just an observation that in the real world, a single measurement is not really that interesting. When we talk about predicting the future, we are automatically implying we are interested in the rate of change of some quantity of that system. Right, so I can check that the weather, the temperature outside is 75 right now, and maybe that's all I care about. But if I'm talking about predicting, I obviously, care about the rate of change of temperature outside, right? So in all these systems, we care about some quantity, or this quantity can be also called a variable in more formal sense. And we care about the rate of change of that quantity. That's what interests us. And that's what we care about when we want to do assurance, safety, all those things that we spoke about in the last lecture. And so this quantity of interest, the thing which you know, we are interested in predicting or the rate of change of which will dictate how the system progresses and how this transformation from inputs to outputs takes place, that is intuitively called a state of a system. And I'll define this more precisely in just a second. But I just want to give you the, the reason why we care about differential equations is not because they are mathematically very beautiful and the theory, theory makes a lot of sense. It's because we care about rate of change of things in the real world, and they are a language to describe rate of change of anything. Right? The word difference automatically implies you are comparing something to either itself or something else. So there's a rate of change involved. So what is a state? Right? So the state of a system is the amount of information or the amount of variables or the quantities that you can measure, which is enough to predict the future behavior or the outputs of the system in the absence of any inputs. So in your, in your head, visualize that image of input system output. If there are zero inputs and I want to predict the output, then I need to know something about what is happening inside the system. And so all that information that I need to know to predict the future outputs or the future behavior of the system is what you can think of as the state of the system. Okay? In many cases, the state and the output may be the same thing, but in some cases, they are not. So this is the formal way to think about the state. When there are zero inputs, what is the amount of information that you require in order to predict the future behavior of the system? And so there can be many, many such variables. There can be just one variable. The one variable can take infinite values, or you know, it can take some discrete values. So you have the states of the system, and all the set of all possible values that they can take is called the state space of the system. This is just a definition. We are still in this you know, uh, mode of defining things before we look at examples, and then it will become crystal clear what, what I mean by that. 
Okay, so now we have some idea of state space and what a state is. Uh, and so I showed you some examples of, you know, uh, to motivate that we care about the rate of change of variables. So for, for each of those examples, here's a plot and, uh, you know, the font is too small for everybody to sort of see what is going on. But I'll point out that what are examples of these states or state variables in each of those examples on the previous slide. So maybe in economics, we care, care about the rate of change of GDP or some economic me metric of progress of a nation. Um, you know, in mechanics, it's straightforward. We care about quantities like velocity, acceleration, distance, and things like that, torque uh, over time. So the rate of change of all of these quantities is of interest to predict the motion or predict the forces of something. Um, you know, in sociology, which is a non-tangible system, uh, we can think of the rate of change of productivity of uh, someone who has a deadline. So, you know, you don't care until the, like the hour before something is due, and then you are at, at your most peak performance, and then you just sort of flatline to zero after, after it's done, right? So, so do you, can, you can describe this with some differential equation, because differential equations are ways to describe rate of change of quantities. So here's an example. Um, it doesn't matter where this equation is coming from, but what this equation is telling you is that if C is the amount of caffeine that you drank in whatever, moles or milligrams, pick your favorite unit, um, then the rate of change of the caffeine in your body is some negative coefficient times the current amount of caffeine in your body, right? So uh, in some sense, this is what is called the first order decay equation. And again, don't panic if you do, haven't you know, seen this in a while. Uh, this is not the, the, the point of this lecture to introduce these models. This is some, I don't know, pharma kinetic model of how drugs influence a body. Uh, so, but the point is that you have, this is an example of a differential equation because we are interested in the rate of change of caffeine in, in someone after they've had a cup of coffee. And that can be described by this equation. And uh, once again, you know, don't worry about all this calculus here, but I, this should be very straightforward that I can, if I have this, differential equation, I can ask questions like, how much time is it going to take uh, until the amount of caffeine left is half of what you drank, right? So, uh, and then you can solve this differential equation by solving this, uh, by just integrating on both sides, and uh, it turns out you can get a very good value of you know, how much time is it going to take uh, if, if you choose some value of this decay constant, then, which is not important here. Okay, so this is a simple example showing how we can uh, how we are interested in describing the rate of change of any uh, physical quantity in this, uh, in this case uh, using a differential equation. Okay? So this should all, you should, must have seen this at some point in your academic journey, I'm 100% sure. So let's recall some things that I also expect you should have seen. So I'm just going to, you know, trigger those neurons uh, which haven't been activated in, in some years or months. Uh, so first thing that you may want to recall is what is an ordinary differential equation, right? This is the most famous form of differential equations out there, the most commonly used. So it's very simple. I just want to recall this to, so, so everybody's on the same page. Uh, ODE is a differential equation where the, the quantity or the variable with respect to which you are taking derivatives is the same throughout the equation. So just for my sanity check, What's the variable with respect to we are derivating in this, in this uh, equation? Everybody should just shout out the answer. It's just so straightforward. Can you be louder so I can feel? Okay, good. Right, so we are derivating with respect to time. And if, more, more, if you care about things with respect to change uh, of their quantity over time, then what we are implying is all derivatives are with respect to time. But it may not be necessary that you are always derivating with respect to time, right? In economics, you derivate with respect to, I don't know, density of population or whatever, right? You can pick some, some variable of interest. So the important part is that the ODE is defined, a differential equation is ordinary if there's only a single variable with respect to which you are taking derivatives of everything in the equation. So when there is more than a single variable, does anyone know what sort of equation do we get? What, is, what equations which are not ordinary, what are they called? Partial. Very good, partial differential equations. Where we are implying that there is not a single variable with respect to which you take derivatives, you partially take derivative to this and partially to this, partially to that. 
So this, in this module, we won't be dealing with partial derivative equations, but I want you to know that you know, when things are not ODE, they are PDE. So that's the first thing to recall. You must have seen this. The second thing is, what is meant by the order of a ODE? So we have a differential equation, it is ordinary. Now I ask, what is the order of this differential equation? So the order of an equation is, this, uh, is defined with respect to some variable, which is being, uh, you know, uh, changing, which is changing over time in this case, if we uh, look at the derivative with respect to time. The order is the highest derivative of a variable which occurs in this equation, right? So you can take second derivative, third, or whatever order derivative you take, uh, that becomes the order of the ODE. Now, a single equation can have multiple variables, right? So we'll see examples where you can take derivatives with respect to displacement, which let's say is x, but you can also take derivatives with respect to your angular rotation, which is say theta. And it could be that the same equation has a term which is x double dot, so it's a second derivative of the displacement, which is acceleration, but it only has theta dot, which is the rate of change of angle. So this equation is second order with respect to x, but first order with respect to theta, because the only highest derivative is just theta dot, and you'll see that in just a second. So that's order, very simple. Perhaps the most important thing about ODEs and the reason why we like them a lot is this next point. And again, I'm quite sure you have seen this already. So the property ODEs have is any ODE with a higher order derivative can be transformed into an equivalent set of ODEs which are all first order. So if you have a third order differential equation, you can transform that single equation into a set of three first order equations. This is perhaps the most important thing that we will exploit in state space systems. So, so I, will, I will show you how this works in just a second, but um, I'm, I'm, I'm quite certain you have seen this at some point. And the reason why we care about this transformation is point number four. We are really good at solving first order ODEs. So it just makes sense to transform any higher order system down to a bunch of first order systems and solve it. And things are maybe a little bit gray in terms of what do we mean by solving and all that, but we'll see that in just a second. Right, so these, the slide number 14 is just a refresher for, for you to, uh, you know, this is what I meant by you should be familiar with ODEs, that you know how all of this works. Okay, so, so this is what I meant by point number three, that if you have a kth order equation, so this is an equation where the derivative, where we are taking a kth order derivative, so the kth derivative of y is a function of time, and all the other possible derivatives of y up till k, so this is a kth order ODE, uh, this, this is not a, um, sorry, this is an ODE because uh, we are only taking derivatives with respect to time, the order of that equation is k, so we can break it down into a, oops, sorry, we can break it down into a set of k first order equations, right? So I can introduce this transformation of variables. Let's say u1 is just y, u2 is y prime, so on and so forth, up till y k minus one derivative. Then I can just stack them or write them independently in this manner where I can rewrite that single equation as a set of k first order equations. Why are they first order? Because the left hand side only has the first derivative of the variable that we have just defined, right? So this should be very, very clear uh, in, your, in your head because this is what we will use for our state space. So any questions on this? Okay. All right, no questions? So good. So we have, this is what I meant by, uh, uh, you know, uh, what you need to know about ODEs. So the next question, you know, we just defined what a system is. Now I'm going to introduce another term called a dynamical system. So my next question is what makes a system dynamic? Is it enough that the inputs, we just defined that you know a system is a relationship between inputs outputs, and is it enough if the inputs change with time and the outputs change with time? Is it enough to call a system a dynamical system, right? So, so to, to sort of motivate this, this uh, discussion, let me, 
um, present an example first, and then we should discuss that example. So this is an example of a, of a hypothetical currency exchange system. Okay? So uh, the input is some currency in dollars, and the output is some uh, equivalent currency in, in some other, you know, in euro or bitcoin or whatever. Right? So, so I'll, I'll give you some examples of inputs over time and outputs over time. So let's say the first input is a $100 bill, and the output is 85 euros. Okay? I actually don't care how the system operates. I don't know what the components are, how, what the interactions are. I'm just observing the inputs, outputs. The next input is $200, output 170 euros. We can keep going, $300, 255 euros. So then my question is, do you think the system is dynamic? Do you consider the system to be dynamic? So how many people say, yeah, this system is dynamic? No one, wow, okay. Then if, if not, then tell me why not. Why is the system not dynamic? The inputs are, and the outputs are. The relationship between input and output is not changing. So, so I am not talking about real exchange systems. I'm just talking about this toy problem of an exchange system, right? This is my. This is my, per if you come to my office, I'll offer you this exchange rate, okay? So I don't care about the real exchange system. So, so okay, there was a point made earlier that the relationship of the inputs and outputs is not changing. So that could mean that it is not dynamic. Any other reasons? Everybody seemed pretty certain this is not dynamic. So why am I not hearing like 40 reasons? <laughs> yeah? What is constant? What is the state of the system? Is, is that the state of the system? The relation between in? Okay, so again, the same question. What is the state of the system? How would you describe it? In the absence of what can you still predict the future? We just defined what a state was. So let me re-ask my original question. How many people think the system is a dynamical system? Still no one. So, so then what are the reasons why you don't think this is a dynamical system? You had your hand up as well. Okay, good, yeah. Okay, so I'm hearing a lot of the same things. Relationship doesn't change. In fact, it's a constant. And another, uh, you know, it is actually the, the logical uh, way to describe it is that it's static. It doesn't change with time. And yes, that is indeed true for this system that the inputs are changing with time, the outputs are changing with time, but the relationship, the relationship is not the state. It's the, the relationship between input and output is, the, is called the system, and the system has some states. So that relationship is actually just a multiply by some 0.85. Right? That's a, it's a constant variable. It doesn't change. So that's why the system is considered not dynamic. The real sort of distinction between a dynamic and a static system is you don't need a differential equation to describe a static system, but you need a differential equation to describe a dynamical system. Okay, so a static system such as this can be described by simple algebraic equation without any derivatives. It could be a linear, it could be a second order polynomial, I don't care. It's just an algebraic relationship, and that system is static. A dynamical system is one where the relationship between inputs and outputs can be described by differential equations. I'm not saying ODE, it could be partial, differential, higher order, whatever, but it can be described by a differential equation, or you need a differential equation to describe it. You cannot describe it algebraically. That's the real 
distinction between a static and a dynamic system. So let's just go over some, some other minor points for the sake of discussion. You have an input, you have an output. So in a static system, there's another notion. This is not broadly applicable, but in the previous example, without any knowledge of the inertia or what the system does, it's almost like the input changes and the output just changes abruptly because it's just an algebraic function. There's no notion of explicit time. Right? You can argue that you know, someone physically will take time to make the exchange, but that's arbitrary. Right? In the mathematical description of this system, it's just an algebraic equation. There's no notion of how long it takes for the output to follow the input. So we can consider that change to be instantaneous. The other thing is, so, so I have some arbitrary example here. It doesn't matter. Uh, we already got the second point, And the final point was that the relationship is algebraic. Whereas in a dynamic system, there is some notion of time. right? So if the system is an actual motor and you apply two volts, it will take some time for the, for the motor to ramp up, for the, for the RPM to change. It won't be instantaneously, because it's not an algebraic uh, relationship. It depends on time. Right? So in a dynamical system, the output takes some time to react, which is another way of saying that the system also has some memory. I want you to plant that seed to you know, rediscover later. And then we have already seen that relationships are dynamic, but the most important thing is you need a differential equation. Without this, you cannot describe the relationship between the inputs and outputs. So in fact, yes, real world currency exchange systems are highly, highly dynamic. In fact, it's very hard to model them because there is no global equation which tells you. Uh, but this, that's, the, that's the distinction. And it's important to know what the distinction is mathematically. Okay. So why do we even care about static systems? They can still be useful, right? So static systems are not, not useful. So uh, I'll give you one example in the in following this example of a motor. Uh, the relationship between how much torque the motor uh, uses and how much speed it can generate can be described with this static relationship. This is a linear relationship. So for any speed, you can see the torque, or for any torque, you can get the speed. And you can still use this in many ways, right? When you are designing something or when you care about the limits of how something operates. But when you actually care about applying some torque and observing some speed, that is a highly dynamic scenario, right? So in reality, when the motor, when you operate the motor, uh, you know, with some, with some speed, um, the torque is not going to, even though it looks like it's instantaneously jumping from this point all the way to six, there's actually a time curve. Right? It's taking some finite time for this to follow the inputs. The change in the inputs are not instantaneously being seen in the output. And the other thing I want to just uh, mention for the sake of it, which is also useful, is in this picture, so this left plot is uh, speed of the motor versus time. And you see after some time, uh, you know, it oscillates about some, some average value between 450 and 500. The same is true for torque. It oscillates with, or settles around some 1.5 value. So such values of the system that um, you know, the, the quantity of interest settles around are sometimes called steady state of the, of the dynamical system. Right? So even though, even though the torque is never 1.5, it's always going to be oscillating around and about that value because of the physical nature of how a motor works. And the ODE can actually model how frequent those changes are. Uh, in general, we can say this has a steady state value of 1.5. This is just something which you know, occurred to me when I, when I showed this plot, so I want to share it. OK, so all the, the story so far was what's a system, what's an ODE, and what's a static and dynamic system. OK, so now we'll actually get into some examples of what state space modeling is. So, this is just a recap of what I said earlier. You have a system. It has a state x. The state is all the information you need to predict the future if there were no inputs. So you can write the rate of change of the state as a function of the inputs, some previous state, and time itself. Okay. So that's how you can generally describe a dynamical system. Now, it is conventional in control systems to consider the initial state as an input. Really, initial state could be also considered as a part of the system itself. It's really just a mathematical distinction, right? So, 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 so if we have to uh, have a differential equation to predict what the speed will be when I apply some torque, I need to begin with what is the speed right now, right? That's the initial state. 
But this is a generic view where everything is time varying. The inputs are time varying, the outputs are time varying, and the relationship between the inputs and outputs. Uh, in this case, I haven't really defined what the output is, but you can imagine that the output is equal to the state, right? So this just for the sake of simplicity. But it could also be another function of the state. Uh, it doesn't really matter. What matters is the relationship between outputs and inputs is time varying in this case. Time is the is the uh, the variable with respect to we take derivatives. That's not always the case. It could be space as well. But the rate of change of the state of the system is a function of all these three things, inputs, time, and the previous state or the existing state. That's what is a dynamical system mathematically as an object. This f could be anything. In fact, more often than not, in real world systems, f is nonlinear. It's almost always nonlinear. It's very rare that a real world system behaves linearly. In fact, all these laws that we read about, you know, some uh, Ohm's laws, a linear relationship, or some other Spring's Hooke's law or something, they are all approximations of nonlinear uh, functions. So is this clear that a dynamical system is just something which describes the rate and change of inputs and outputs with some nonlinear model which is time dependent? So in this case, we can augment the definition of the state a little bit, right? So earlier I said the state is defined in the absence of no inputs, but I'm just telling you that the state also depends on the inputs, which is what a system is, right? In, uh, inputs come in, they influence the state, and the output comes out. So we can have a modified definition of the state that any future state can be determined exactly if you know the initial state at any time and all the sequence of inputs until the time you want to predict. Does that make sense? The only things which can change the state are your current state, which depends upon where you began from, so initial state, the inputs that are changing the state, and time itself. So if you have a history of all the inputs, you can predict your state at any time. That's what is meant. In fact, I would even say this is exactly the same thing as in the absence of inputs, you are predicting the future. That's equivalent to this statement, that in the non-absence of future, you require every input to the system to predict the future, which is very, very sort of obvious. So here's a distinction, and this is sort of setting up our next lecture already. We saw what the order of a differential equation was. It's the, this is the highest degree of derivative in that equation. The order of a system, in particular a dynamical system, is the minimum number of states required for that statement to be true. So if you reread that statement, that a state of a system is something that can be used to predict the future, provided you know the initial state and all the inputs. There is no notion for, or there's no requirement that it has to be only three states or five states or uh, one square root of something states. It could be infinite states. That's all you need to do predict the future. But every system can also have a system order which says what is the minimum set of states I need for that statement to be true. And this will become relevant uh, sort of when we discuss the next uh, next part of the of the systems theory. Okay, so let's let's change directions a little bit. I'll give you an example of why all of this matters, right? So, one of the things when when you come across this material, which is very abstract, is uh, you lose touch with reality on you know where does it actually get used. So, so I'll, I'm going to give you a real world example of where a differential equation is very very powerful. There are many such exa examples. Um, and the irony is that to, to give you a real world example, I'm going to begin with a hypothetical thought experiment, right? Which, which you will see as a, this is useless, but I'll show you what, what the use of this is. This is a very classical uh, example in control theory. And uh, you know the idea is you have a cart with some mass. The cart can move freely on, on a surface. Uh, the cart has a hinge in, uh, on the top, and there is a, is a bar or a, or a pendulum or a lever with some length and mass and moment of inertia or whatever. Uh, and, and you can see that when you move the cart left or right, if the lever is at its steady state position or uh, equilibrium, where, where the value of theta would be uh, 180 degrees or pi, which is you know the, uh, the pendulum is vertical, if you move the cart left or right, um, the pendulum will fall to either side, right? So this, this, uh, this is a very classical problem because the control problem or closing the loop problem here is uh, 
given some value of theta, can you determine how much force to apply in order to keep this uh, pendulum stable always? Right? So, so someone has given some uh, uh, impulse to the pendulum, it's about to fall, but you move the cart instantaneously in the other direction, and because of inertia, this comes back to the center position. Right? So it's a very classical problem, uh, and it cannot be solved without differential equations. So if anyone has ever tried this, you know, you know what I'm talking about. Your brain has been solving ODEs all the time, uh, and now I'm just going to show you how that works. Uh, and if you're someone like me who, who sort of, you know, wants to take a break and does arbitrary things on the internet, you must have seen such games where you have to, you know, you have to land some lunar lander. This is the inverse pendulum problem, right? Because because it, it will tip over if you don't give it, you know, correction forces. It's a very hard problem because you have limited fuel and whatnot. Uh, and this is actually harder than just a regular inverted pendulum because not only do we care about landing vertically, we also care about not landing too harshly. So you have to control the rate of descent as well. So it's even more complicated, but the, the essence of this is the same as the inverse pendulum. So ODEs can come to the rescue. Right? We want to, uh, this is what we want to do. We want to figure out forces to control the pendulum. And uh, already, you know, I can sh tell you that not only is this useful in the real world in some major impact sense, we can actually model and build these on real hardware. This is a, a simple robot on a rail which can move left or right. And, uh, uh, you know, it's built using an Arduino. We know the mass of everything. We will use exactly what I'm going to talk about next, and this works in the real world. So already we have transitioned from our thought experiment into the lab, but I want to see this point through on how do we actually do this. So uh, again, th the next set of slides, don't get scared. There's a lot of math, but uh, uh, I'll like, walk you through everything. So what is the problem? The problem is that uh, our, our pendulum begins with theta equal to pi, which means it's straight. The requirement is that the angle of the pendulum never exceeds some value from the vertical, right? So uh, if, if you are 30 degrees apart from the vertical, then you probably need infinite force to bring you back. So the game is already lost in some sense, right? So there's a requirement on the problem that the pendulum has to not deviate more than a certain region. And also there's a time requirement, right? So there, there must be some maximum time before which it returns. It cannot take a long time for the pendulum to return. So how do we use ODEs to set up this problem? Uh, so this is something you may have not seen in many years, but for such a system, we can write the Newtonian uh, equations of motion. So, so don't panic, okay, let me talk you through what is happening here. Essentially, we think of two systems, the cart and the, and the pendulum, and we arbitrarily initiate some contact forces, right? So there's a force N at the hinge, which will cancel each other, and there's a force P in the vertical direction which will cancel each other. The reason we do this free body diagram is that it makes it easy to solve such systems. And so what, you, what is happening here, it's not really important if you don't remember kinematics. What is important is uh, how do we use ODEs or how can we represent this system with an with a ODE. So the very first line is we look at just the cart and we say F is equal to MA, the new, uh, first law of motion. So force is equal to all the other forces, right? So F is equal to the friction, which depends on velocity and not just position. It's equal to this, uh, uh, you know, contact force in the, in the horizontal direction as well. Uh, and, it, and it is equal to mass times acceleration, the mass of the, of the cart times acceleration. So that's this first equation. It's very simple. We are just balancing the horizontal forces on just the cart. Then in the second equation, we do the same process. We are balancing forces on the horizontal axis of the pendulum, right? So over there, N, which is this force in the horizontal direction, is equal to some, you know, cosine components and some sine components of the of the mg force, which is the gravity force on the on the pendulum, and it doesn't really matter, you know, where these are coming from. That's it's, it's fine. You don't need to learn that or be familiar with it. So when you do that on the horizontal axis, in this equation or in this system, we introduce this n is an arbitrary choice, right? I pulled it out of a uh, thin air and introduced it into the system. So I will eliminate n from both these equations, and I will get one governing equation in the horizontal direction which associates force 
along the entire system in the horizontal direction. Okay, when once again, doesn't matter if you don't really follow, it's actually not that hard to derive this, but that's not the point here. What is the point? The point is who can tell me what is the order of this equation? Is it two with respect to what? With respect to, and what about theta? Yeah, so why is it two? It's two because there's second order derivative terms. X double dot appears here. Theta double dot appears here. I haven't explained you this yet, but just out of curiosity, would you consider this relationship between the force and the components uh, linear or nonlinear? We haven't discussed this, but I think you can answer it. What's the, so? Is, is, there, is this equation with respect to x and theta linear or nonlinear? It's nonlinear, right? You have some confidence in your, in your ability to answer. Uh, why is it nonlinear? It's actually highly nonlinear. Because not only you have square terms, let me use this so that it's captured on the recording. You have square terms, but you also have like sine and cosine terms, which are nonlinear functions, right? So this is a very, very nonlinear equation. Okay, so we did this for the horizontal. Without going into individual equations, we can do this for the vertical direction as well, okay? So over there, we have introduced this arbitrary uh, force P, so we balance the force out in both the cart and the pendulum. We eliminate P and we get this equation in the vertical direction which is again a second order equation in x, a second order equation in theta and nonlinear. So what we have essentially done is we have described the system by two equations in horizontal and vertical, both second order in terms of theta and x. Now, here's a very important trick. In this equation, we began with some assumptions, right? We thought that we don't want theta to deviate too much. We want some time property or whatnot. So we can incorporate that, we can say, let me actually define a variable phi that is, so theta is defined from you know, this uh, origin all the way uh, in this uh, anti-clockwise direction. So theta equal to pi is equilibrium, but I'm now defining a variable phi such that phi describes how much you deviate from the pi position, from the vertical position. So phi is only measuring these perturbations of the pendulum. And the thing is, when these perturbations are small, these nonlinear functions can be approximated in this manner, right? So to give you an example, for when something is very small and you take the square of it, you are making it even smaller. So we can just approximate that by zero. And for the sine and cosine, you know, these are properties that you must have studied. You can approximate these functions when the value of phi is small. So with this trick, we can rewrite the equations in a simplified manner because we are going to eliminate theta square terms, we are going to eliminate sine cosine with these approximations. So we can now describe this entire system with these two differential equations, okay? They are all ordinary differential equations because we are taking the derivative of x and theta with respect to time the same variable, but they are not first order equations because we have theta double dot terms and x double dot terms. But they are linear equations now in terms of x and theta. There is no theta square or x square or sort of cross multiplication term over here. So once you have, this is how typically we model a system mathematically, we make assumptions. Uh, and I, I will explain the next step in more detail with another example, but I want to just show you, once you have a second order, so this is a second order equation in X, we have a second order equation in theta. So recall, you can convert a kth order equation into K first order equations. So we have a second order X and a second order theta, we can write it as a set of four ordinary differential equations, two for X and two for theta. So it doesn't matter right now, it's barely even visible, but you can write this system as a set of four equations now. And what you see here, I haven't explained it yet, is what is called state space representation of a system, right? All this 
monologue was to get you to this point of we can take a differential equation and all we are doing is just rearranging stuff. State space is not some new theory or some new equation or some new derivatives that you have to, it's not the operator. It's a rearrangement of things using the property that you can take a kth order ODE and convert it into k first order ODEs. And so then I'm going to next describe how you actually do that. But to, to also conclude or close the loop on the real world examples, so you, you can take a pendulum, you can build a ODE, you can get a ODE, you can make a state space model, and then you can take the state space model all the way to space and back, okay? This is how we are able to land rockets back on, uh, on barrages which are floating in the ocean. This is an inverse pendulum problem. I'm, I'm not claiming this is as simple as our problem, but it's the same principle. So indeed, something as trivial as this thought process of a controlling a pendulum is being used in the real world and with very good use, in fact. And so, you know, we have to keep up with this advancement, so people have modified the game as well. You can now try to land this manually. It's very hard. Yeah, but yeah, don't waste too much time on this one. Okay, so this was just an example. I haven't yet taught you how to transform into state space. Uh, we'll do that in the next sort of 10 minutes. So recall, this is where we sort of started. Uh, a system has a state which is dynamical system. There's a time varying uh, function, possibly a nonlinear function. We just saw an example of a nonlinear function with these theta squared and cosine sine terms. It depends upon x, u, and other time parameters. Um, so what happens is, in reality, many systems that we observe, especially true for real tangible physical systems, this function could be nonlinear, but it usually doesn't depend upon time, right? So let me sort of give you an example. Um, the laws of motion, they are the same with time, right? Newton's laws don't change over time. F equals to MA is true today, it will be true in a minute from now, it has been true forever. So the physics of the world is not changing with time. And what is this relationship for physical systems? The relationships between inputs and outputs is usually through physics. That's the sort of the, you know, the, the main point of this module. So this function F could depend upon time varying inputs and time varying outputs, but the function itself may be not a function, not varying with time, right? So, so in the previous example, the mass of the cart, the mass of the pendulum doesn't change over time. The length of the pendulum doesn't change over time as well. That's what I mean to say that the physics is constant. And we'll use this fact uh, in, in, a, in a bit for, the, for our example. So you know the laws don't change, the inputs can be time dependent and the parameters also remain the same, which are the three points I, I already said. The another thing which we have already seen is another useful uh, uh, sort of tool in uh, dynamical systems is linearity. So let's say we have a nonlinear function. This function is uh, just a parabola, y is equal to x squared, so it's nonlinear in x. What linearity does is it says that at any point, in this case at 1 comma 1, you can approximate the function in this green area you can approximate the function with a linear function, right? So this blue line will not describe the entire black curve, but in this neighborhood, these values are close enough. We actually just used this like 30 seconds ago when I said that we can introduce phi and simplify cosine, sine, and square into these terms. This is exactly what we did. We linearized a nonlinear function, so this is something you know we will revisit, but I wanted to, again, uh, introduce it here. Um, so what is a state space uh, representation? Formally, a state space model is just a arrangement of a set of ODEs in such a manner that all the equations in the state space representation are first order. So we take a differential equation, ODE, and we break it down into first order equations, and then we arrange them in a specific format such that we can describe the system with a series of first order equations, and the output equation is an algebraic equation, and I'll make that 
um, make that very clear in the, in the next example. So maybe let's get to the example to sort of really show you how do you uh, build a state space model. And this is, in fact, something you will do in your assignment as well. So let's say we have a system where we have an input u of t, and we have x of uh, the derivative of x is the output, right? So we define y as x dot. So the output is the derivative of x. Uh, and then there's a relationship between the input u and how x changes. Uh, so very quick uh, sort of uh, uh, recap. Uh, what is the order of the equation in terms of x? It's, it's, it's 3, right? Because it has the x triple dot term. So the, the task is I want to rewrite this dynamical system in state space representation. So what are the steps to follow? Well, first, I can take a third order system, which is this equation, x triple dot plus 5, x double dot plus blah, 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 equal to u. Uh, we can take this third order system and write it in three first order equations. Right? So if we make these transformations that let me introduce a new variable x1, which is the same as x. x2 is the derivative of x and x3 is the derivative of x double dot. So just within this transformation, what is x2 in terms of x1? x1 dot, right? Because x2 is the derivative of x and x is x1. And same way, x3 is x, is x2 dot. And so I make use of these transformations. I can write a first order equation, x1 dot is x2, x2 dot is x3, and since this equation had a third order term, and I have x3, which is a second order term, I can replace this third order term with the derivative of x3. And therefore, this equation also becomes a first order equation in x3. Okay, this is the sort of the take home message pretty much at this point. We are using that property of ODEs by doing very trivial transformation of variables. Now we have three ODEs. Can anyone tell me what this equation will look like? What would this become after our transformation, y equals x dot, with our new variables? y equals x2, right? Because x dot is x2, right? So this is, this is not rocket science, unlike the inverse pendulum. Uh, so y equals x dot is y equals x2. Is y equals x2 a differential equation or an algebraic equation? y equals x2 is an algebraic relationship, which is exactly what we defined. We can represent a system by first order state equations and an algebraic output equation, okay? So you already have done this. So we can write the system as state equations, which are all first order. That's the requirement for state space. They have to be first order state equations. The output equation will always be algebraic. Then, we want to transform this, and you know, just to reiterate, with this, with this introduction of variables, earlier our system had only one state, which was x. The input was u and the output was y. Now we have an input u, output y, but we have three states that we have introduced ourselves to do this transformation. What remains to be done is, let me skip this and get to the point first, to write the set of equations that we have in this form, where x dot is some function of x plus some function of inputs, and y is some function of x plus some function of inputs. And in particular, these could be any functions, but when we write uh, in the state space forms, a, b, c, d are usually matrices, and you will see in a second why that is the case, right? So, from our previous example, we have these state equations on the left, and we have an output equation. I can now write this set of three equations in this vector form. So I define a state vector, which, is, which has three components. And this vector we can call x. Don't confuse it with the original x. But this vector, the derivative of this vector is some matrix times the vector itself. Okay, this, is the, this part is the same as Ax in this equation. So all we have done is we have taken our state equations and 
transformed in this, to represent, in this representation where we have A times X itself plus B times U. B can usually be a matrix as well, but in this case we only have one input, so it's also a vector. Right? And to convince yourself, uh, let me do one of them. So X3 dot or X1 dot is this row multiplied by this column. So X1 dot is X2, checks out. X3 dot is negative 2X1, negative 3X2, negative 5X3, which is this equation, plus the only equation where U features is X3 dot, which is true here as well, right? So X3 dot is one times U. Very, very simple. It's just we have taken a set of equations and introduced what is called a matrix notation. That's what state space is. If you have to think of it, you know, to save some thought process. You are just representing equations in matrix form. Y equals X2. We want to write this as Y equals C times state plus D times input. That's what this will look like. Y is equal to X2 and D is zero for our, for our system. Okay, so this is what is called a state space representation. It will form the basis of the physics-based modeling that we will do in this first part of the, of the course, okay? So to recap, to do this state space transformation, you identify what the inputs are, you identify what the variables are, you identify what the states are after you have, you know, gotten everything into the first order form, and then you essentially write this in this manner of uh, x dot equals ax plus bu and y equals cx plus du, always remembering that the output equation has to be algebraic, not differential. So questions on this? If this is unclear or it was too fast, too slow, anything? Is it clear? Because this is what you have to do for your, pretty much your assignment. Okay, so I always want to question, you know, what you learn. So why bother? Why did we do all this effort? Right? Why can't we just use three equations? Why do we have to do this fancy mathematical transformation? Is it only because they look better on slides or on paper? But what's the reason for, for the last 60 minutes, in your opinion? Can you explain why it would be better computation? Exactly. The reason why we use state space representations primarily is we are very good at doing matrix operations, okay? If you have done neural networks or convolution neural networks, they are all matrix operations. We have gotten very good at matrix multiplication and all these things. So that's why we want to represent dynamics of systems in that format. But that's not the only reason. There's other reasons as well. Um, reason number three is good. In control systems, this representation actually allows for a very geometric understanding of how the system can operate. So remember, you know, in the inverse pendulum, there was this notion of you have to return back in five seconds or a requirement. If I had the state space representation, I didn't have to do anything but look at some elements of A and B and tell you whether that is possible or not, just based on the geometry of A, B, C, D. Right, so we won't get too much into that, but that's another reason. So uh, let me just conclude with a few definitions that we will revisit later. Uh, the first is when your matrices A, X, B, U, uh, sorry, X and U are not matrices, A, B, C, D are also time varying, and X and U are always time varying, this is called a continuous time linear dynamical system. Why is this linear, by the way? Because uh, it's linear in X, right? There's no X square term. It's linear in U as well. There is no U square or higher order U term. There is no cross multiplication of X and U. That would be bilinear. So this is a linear continuous time dynamical system where T could be any value. It's real, so it could be any value. It could be infinitely small, infinitely large value. X is the state, U is the input, Y is the output, and then uh, these matrices also have some special names. I'll just tell them so that you know when you read papers and you encounter these terms, uh, you should know what the peop uh, author is referring to. So A is called the state transition matrix or the dynamics matrix, and it makes sense now because A is telling us how does the state transition or evolve. That's why it's a state transition or dynamics matrix. B is input matrix, no wonder, no surprises there, it's getting multiplied by U. 
C is the output matrix or sensor matrix. C is telling me how does the output depend upon the state, right? That's why the output matrix. D, if you look at this equation, the output can not just depend upon the state, it can also depend upon the input directly. So in, in some sense, it's bypassing the state and the input, uh, input is directly influencing the output without going through the state dynamics. That's what the matrix D does. So that's why it's called feed through, because you are sort of bypassing the state and directly feeding through the input to the output through this elements of D over here. Right, so there's rhyme and reason behind the names of these metrics, and they have very interesting properties too. Um, so, like I said, you know, most linear, uh, most systems that we encounter, they are time invariant because of the reasons aforementioned. The laws of physics don't change, masses don't change uh, abruptly, and things like that. So, the, what that translates in, in our state space representation is that the ABCD matrices are usually not time varying. Right, in this previous picture of continuous time uh, linear dynamical systems, we have A, B, C, and D, which are functions of time, which means each of their elements can also vary with time. But in reality, we will mostly deal with time invariant system, where A, B, C, D are, are constant. The elements don't depend upon time, right? The, the values of the resistances of the circuit and the capacitors of the circuit don't just change arbitrarily. When there is no input U, the system is called autonomous. Don't confuse this with autonomous vehicles. That's a different uh, sort of interpretation of autonomous. Here, you know, uh, we said in the very beginning, if there is no input, all you need to know is the set of states to predict the output. So that's sort of a system which can internally uh, extend or evolve its dynamics without external influence is sometimes called an autonomous system. Uh, and in many, many cases, also, I think it would be true for some of the examples in your homework. Uh, in many cases, there is no feed-through matrix, right? So in the output equation of y equals cx plus d, d is usually zero. So these are all, again, some terminology. Um, more terminology, very in, this is very simple. If you have one input and one output, it's called a single input, single output, or SISO system. Uh, otherwise, it could be a multi-input multiple output system, which is also fine, right? So all this is saying is that the, the vector y, it could also have a bunch of elements. It's not always a scalar. So in, in addition to having continuous time systems, we also can have discrete time systems. The only distinction is that unlike continuous time systems where the variable t could take any real value, discrete time systems only progress in some uniform time steps, okay, or in discrete steps. So you can only pick values in some defined set. You can't just take any continuous value. Everything still applies. Um, just out of curiosity, is this system time invariant or, or not? Would you consider this time invariant? Answer this and then we can end. <laughs> okay, so we have someone who says yes. What about others? So why yes? But K is changing from zero to one to two every step. So it is not a time invariant system because the elements of A, B, C, D are also changing with discrete time, right? It's not continuous time, but they're still changing. Okay, so finally, I want to just answer why do we care about linear systems in particular because this is a linear system in X and U. Uh, we care about linear systems for the same reasons we care about state space form. We are very good at solving linear systems. In fact, there's a, um, there's a quote by Richard Feynman that, you know, we like linear systems because we can solve them, and I couldn't agree more. And so in our, in our physics-based modeling, regardless of whether that is for buildings or, or anything else, we will always try to get into this state space linear time invariant form, and that's what will allow us to leverage a lot of tools and control and systems identification to build models 
that can predict the future outputs of our system. Okay, that's the end goal. Uh, in the next lecture, we'll begin with the, the main sort of uh, point in this uh, module, which is what do we mean by first principles and first principles modeling. Okay, so feel free to grab a handout and I'll see you next week.